In the heart of Southeast Asia, within the jungles of Brunei, is Anduki Airfield. It is Brunei Shell Petroleum's only service hub for an offshore energy industry that supplies 300,000 barrels of oil and gas daily. A fleet of three helicopters ferries up to 360 people a day. But with new platforms in the South China Seas, operations at Anduki need to expand. Today, project engineer Carl Akonli and his team are taking delivery of shrink-wrapped new additions. It's a process that's been going on and on, and you know, you've always had a deadline and you know they're coming, but it's actually physically having them here makes a huge difference now. Ordered one year ago, shipped nearly 11,000 miles. Is that it? There's no more trucks? And costing over 26 million US dollars. Two brand new Augusta Westland AW139 helicopters. We've always been a fairly small operation, so this has almost doubled our operation from three aircraft to five aircraft. But before they can fly, there is the big job of unpacking and assembling each aircraft. So it's quite an exciting time for the guys to see brand new helicopters arriving at Anduki. It's not something that happens very often. It's time for the team to get hands on. These are the first AW139s in Brunei and the finishing touch in a large expansion of operations. Everything is brand new, including the engineer you're talking to. Uh, <laughs> the paint, the people, everything even smells new, so it's, uh, it's a new adventure for everyone. Bartek Sheshepan is part of the engineering team responsible for these state-of-the-art helicopters. It's the first day with the aircraft in our hangar, so we essentially just uh, looking over it from the outside in, making sure that uh, everything appears to be uh, arrived in one piece without any damage from shipping. It's not just new helicopters, there's a whole new crew of pilots, and it's David Cameron's job to fit man to machine. It's a new aircraft to us as an organization. We've got new crews flying together that haven't flown together in the past. So we've got to get all these guys who we know are competent, professionally trained, and get them to follow our standard operating procedure. Before David can begin training his new pilots, every single component must be thoroughly checked by the engineers. We'll check the batteries, check the voltages. This aircraft needs two batteries, each twice the voltage of an average car's. Without them, the helicopter is immobilized. At the moment, we have a flat battery, the aircraft internal battery. It may just have discharged in transit because it's been so long, it's been many months to get here. The batteries will take at least two days to fully recharge. In the meantime, the engineers focus on the safety features. This, for example, is a rear float. In the event of the aircraft having to make an emergency landing on water, this becomes a big balloon. Inside it has uh, nitrogen bottles and the cover blows away. And so now you got a, an expensive floating raft. Project engineer Carl is running the checks on these flotation devices. So there was a, a minimum pressure that should be in those bottles. And as you see, there's a graph here on the side which allows us to calculate what that pressure should be. The bottles in this aircraft are below the minimum pressure that is acceptable to fly this aircraft. It was definitely at 4,000 when it left. Now we've just checked it here and the guys just tell me it's at 3,000 again. So there's, there's a leak somewhere. So even if I charge it up, it's still going to drop. In this particular case, we are not allowed to charge the bottles. These float bottles can only be repressurized at the manufacturers in California. It could mean a two-week wait. That obviously now means that we no longer have floats on this aircraft, which means we cannot fly over water. And as our primary role is offshore maritime, oil and gas, that is a problem. The search is on for a spare float bottle. If Carl can't find a fully pressurized replacement, this brand new helicopter will be grounded. Meanwhile, 
Bartek is checking out the blades for the other AW139. What do we have in these boxes? Our main rotor blades, and I'm about to uh, inspect them. So we'll have to remove them from the box, put them on our little stand, and have a good long look at them, make sure everything is okay. The five main composite rotor blades will slot into a titanium hub and create a 14 meter wide span. It's okay, I got, I got this end, it's okay. As Bartek prepares to fit the blades, Carl has found a replacement float bottle in stores. We've got a spare bottle. Take this off, change the bottle out, and then we'll send the spare away and get them to recharge it for whoever needs to recharge it. This aircraft is back on track. On the other side of the hangar, the five $150,000 blades are ready to install. Putting main rotor blades on, and it just makes the helicopter look complete. So now it looks like it's at least somewhat fit for flight. Uh, without it, it's like a wingless bird, right? While engineers get the helicopter ready, pilot David Cameron turns up to check out his new toy. Judicious use of the hammer. Yeah. Jolly good. <laughs> the hammer can be a very useful tool. We don't actually call them hammers, we call them persuaders. As soon as a pilot appears on the scene, a little bit of a nervousness runs through the crowd, and understandably so. With all five rotor blades fitted and the final ones in place on the tail, David is one step closer to flying the new helicopter. The only outstanding things we have are the number two comm antenna. The assembly of the AW139 is complete. A battery refitted uh, service because they're both flat. Okay, yep. It's passed a ground test. We got all the batteries on. And is now approved for flight. So David can take it up for a spin. These are the approvals that allow us to fly the aircraft. This is the final stage of the legal side of it that says that we're allowed to go and fly this aircraft and carry passengers to the offshore environment. It has taken nearly two weeks, but finally these $13 million aircraft can take to the Brunei skies for the first time. All the anticipation, the aircraft are being prepped by the engineers, waiting for certification, writing all of the manuals and checklists, doing all the training, and then to actually get into the aircraft is obviously a sheer joy. It does take you back to the first time you flew an aircraft where you, you do have a big grin on your face because it fundamentally is a fun job. There's no two ways about it. On a nice sunny day like today, going out and flying the aircraft is just a sheer joy. The new kit will enable Anduki to be an efficient service hub for Brunei's expanding offshore industry well into the next decade. <laughs>